So we've talked about Alex Lifeson as the not so most underrated guitar player of all time. We've talked about Neil Peart as my favorite artist of all time. Now it's time to give some attention to Getty Lee. So I thought I would do this video on the road uh, talking about Getty Lee because it's my turn to drive, but it's my Okay, get it, yeah, it's your turn to drive. So what I wanted to talk about is, you know, what a great monster musician Getty Lee is. And he's really the ultimate multitasker in, in music, and certainly in rock music and progressive rock and whatnot. There are very few people that do or did what Getty Lee was able to accomplish throughout his career. So you talk about a man who was somewhat pushed into playing bass, somewhat pushed into singing, somewhat pushed into playing keyboards, and then somewhat having to do all those things at the same time. So there are not many musicians that uh, have, have had to wear all those hats, per se, uh, to make the sound of a three-piece sound, you know, more than three-piece. I want to just talk briefly about each of these um, things that Getty does that or that he had to do in the band and how that relates to ultimately what makes him such a unique artist in the music industry. So number one, let's talk about the keyboards for a moment, uh, his role as a keyboardist in the band. Um, it's not something that he did at first at all, actually. That's something that came into the fore, I want to say... Uh, 2112 maybe I'd have to listen back to see if he did any keyboards in uh, Caress of Steel and you know he may have done it afterwards I, I, I'd have to listen back to it but they definitely um, did not become let's say prominent prominent uh, until the Farewell to Kings record where he started incorporating keyboards more and synthesizers and obviously as time was on, went on they he used it more and more and certainly in the 80s that was really when uh, the keyboards took off and until it got to the point where Alex Lifeson said, hey, uh, your your sound stage is intruding on my sound stage. Uh, back it up. So <laughs> for 1989's release of Presto, there's much less keyboards in there and more of a, a three-piece sound. But in any case, it's interesting how the band is a three-piece and they decided that they wanted to remain a three-piece no matter how complicated the music got because you know they would create their music and over time they th they saw that well I mean keyboards would go good here and um, instead of getting another member of the band you know Getty, Getty just uh, took it upon himself or they agreed however they agreed and he added that to his repertoire now is he the best keyboardist in rock no, and not even close. And I have actually seen polls where, you know, they included Getty Lee as one of the best keyboardists. I would say that, um, uh, that's not that good. I would say that as far as his ability to play keyboards, it's really good. Um, but it was never the main part. Uh, even in the 80s, you know, it was still complimentary. Um, and there, it certainly. The keyboards certainly stood out in the 80s, but, you know, if you have the likes of Rick Wakeman of Yes, Tony Banks of Genesis, and, you know, Keith Emerson of Emerson, Lincoln, Palmer, and, and more that escape me right now that are excellent uh, keyboardists, you know, those musicians were virtuosos in keyboards, which Geddy Lee uh, admittedly, even himself has admitted, he's, he's not... He, you know, he's taken lessons for piano and stuff like that, but, you know, it never was his main focus. But the keyboards that he did play in the band, was, you know, as they did with everything as part of the band, totally fit into the music that they were doing. So kudos to Getty for um, taking on the keyboards uh, even after he was playing bass and singing. And even playing rhythm guitar, too. Uh, you know, he had the double neck Rickenbacker and... Um, he played uh, guitar when, when needed as well. So, you know, more multitasking for him. Next thing I want to talk about is his singing ability. 
and that's been spoken about to death uh, but I'm gonna speak about it a little more in the early days he was he was very screechy he had a wild range in his voice and you know over time I think probably in the 80s where his where he had the best range or he can make the best use of his range and I contend that signals is actually his best singing album although you know others may disagree but to me that was his best that was the peak of his singing ability after that I don't think he sang better but um, as far as the skill of singing maybe that improved but I think his voice peaked uh, in the early 80s he's not considered has never been considered the best singer uh, but he's definitely he definitely has a unique voice and if you listen to all of the catalog of Rush he, he spans so much he spans so much range in his singing that you could say that he's one of the best singers in rock history because of the versatility of his voice and the uniqueness of his voice and the longevity of his voice because even in the R40 tour when it was the end and he was struggling quite a bit but he could sing still in the original key that he sang in the 70s amazing um, endurance so as far as Geddy Lee's voice um, fantastic and unique and you know for a lot of people an acquired taste but certainly once you acquire it you understand it and you love it now let's talk about his bass playing um, yeah so he's considered a world-class monster bass player uh, in the bass industry let's say uh, he's considered one of the best um, and for that caliber of musician there are a lot of bass players and that applies to drummers and keyboardists and guitar you know all of those instruments once you're in that category of greatness they're all the best I mean they just have different abilities you know everybody plays differently and he's definitely in that stratosphere of you know top 1% of bass players ever um, there's no question about that um, you know he's he's created the licks uh, if you listen to songs like um, La Via Strangiato, YYZ, um, Leave That Thing Alone, the solos in the Time Machine tour, very well documented as far, and you know, throughout the whole catalog of Rush, even as Alex Lifeson is soloing in his solo, you can hear Getty, you know, it's kind of like he's soloing on the bass too, but you know, you almost don't notice it, that's how good he, that's how good he was at, you know, doing his thing, but it didn't overshadow what the other players were doing. There's really not much to say or even argue about. Not only you know Rush fans how they adore Giddy's playing, but in the music industry as a whole, he's definitely considered one of the best bass players um, in modern times. Well, I mean, as long as the bass guitar has existed, he's one of the best. I was getting getting darker on here. Let me get out of the trees. Okay, so you know there. There are other keyboardists that play better than Getty. There are other singers that sing better than him. There are other, you know, bass players that play some like better than him. But the one thing that I don't think any musician, and at least in rock, can compare is his multitasking ability. He certainly mastered the ability to sing and play bass at the same time which many do admittedly um, but then when he incorporated the keyboards and he's doing all those three things at the same time that was another level up and you don't notice it until you see him live everything they're doing and I made a video previously re um, reacting to not reacting, but it's kind of like an analysis of Xanadu, the live performance from the Moving Pictures tour, which is one of my one of my favorite Rush songs of all time. That version particularly, and there's a section in there where he's singing, he's playing the bass, and he's using the foot pedals as keyboard, um, doing it all at the same time. And you wouldn't know it until you see a certain angle where they show his feet moving. And it's like, oh, he was doing that the whole time. He was playing the bass, he was singing and playing keyboards with his feet. Um, and then towards the end of the song, he's playing rhythm guitar too. 
<laughs> so um, I contend that Geddy Lee is the best multitasking musician, at least in rock, at least one of the best multitasking musicians in, in all of music. And that's really what I wanted to emphasize uh, for this video as, you know, as it's starting to get dark and, uh, you know, I'm just driving around thinking of these things uh, about the band. Um, as far as his part in the band, Rush, you know, this is something that created the illusion of many more than three members in the band. And then when you see them perform songs live, you're mesmerized at their ability. You know, all three of the members are multitasking. Um, but really, uh, as far as multitasking goes, there is no equal in the music industry. Um, there's no musician, to me, that compares to Geddy Lee. So I'm going to deem him, uh, I will ordain him the greatest multitasker in rock history. So that's my spiel on Geddy Lee. Uh, let me know if you agree or if you disagree. If you can name me any other musician in rock, let's keep it to, to rock music. Because I don't think in jazz, I mean, jazz is very specialized. They specialize in one instrument. But uh, if you can show me or let me know of other musicians in rock that multitask the way Geddy Lee did it, uh, please let me know in the comments. Or if you think there are other musicians that, uh, you know, do that kind of thing better than him. This is Omar of All About Rush, and I'll see you in the next video.